This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible-believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome to another video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth on the War on Disinformation. I've come here today, the 20th of April, to do the next reading of the wonderful book, The History of the Inquisition. I really like this book. The farther we go in there, the more I like it. And I'm very much looking forward even to part two, because you have to understand we are still in the introduction and that is just part one. I'm still not <laughs> convinced that this is actually what uh, the original author wrote. I think that the whole introduction is uh, written by Samuel Chandler, the person who translated uh, part one, uh, part two, volume two. I think that is only volume two that is by Limborch. I have no trouble with that because I like what we are reading here. This is very uh church like this is very bible like uh, all the citations uh, so far they come from the king james of course because at that time there were no corrupted bibles that started in the 19th century in the late 19th uh, in the early and late 19th century but uh, in the 18th century and even in the 17th century there only was the king james and that's the one that's cited in this book so let's continue on page uh, 122, if I'm not mistaken, where I left a little note on the 17th of April, so three days ago, that I should pick it up here. <coughs> I, as, as always, didn't have time to prepare the reading very much, only the next uh, page and a half about a little I read once, because I'm uh, doing the recordings with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update for the moment on... Uh, the origin of futurism and preterism, and we probably come to an end of that tonight. Uh, an hour or two from here, two and a half from here, we will probably do the next reading on that. But this is now the history of the Inquisition by Philip van Limborch. So on the bottom of page 122, as you can see where the highlighted part is here in the video, 
The author continues, I would add that as the apostles received this commission from Christ, they were bound to confine themselves wholly to it and not to exceed the, lim the limits of it. There were his servants who sent them, and the message they received from him, that, and that only, the message from Jesus Christ were they to deliver to the world, nothing uh, to be added, nothing taken away, pure and simple, the words of Jesus Christ. Thus, St. Paul says to himself that God had committed to him the word of reconciliation and that he was an ambassador for Christ, that he preached not himself, Paul, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and himself the servants to others for Jesus' sake, that he had no dominion over others' faith. Paul had no dominion over others' faith, but that is exactly what the Pope always claims. He has dominion over the faith of others, and Tom made it very clear in uh, his broadcasts in 2009 that you can listen to in the archives of First Amendment Radio that when he listened to uh, WETN, so this eternal uh, Roman Catholic network in 2008 during the time of the Pope's visit in 2008 to the United States of America that he heard, and, and he explains who this guy is, uh, um, I can't uh, remember all the names, but Tom says it very clearly there, that he says that according to Roman Catholic canon law, no man has the right to choose his own religion. Can you understand that? According to Roman Catholic canon law, no man has the right to choose his own religion. So what we read here that he, Paul, had no dominion over others' faith. No, not Paul. No, not Peter, who never was in Rome. The apostles had no dominion over others' faith. The only thing that they can do is that they preach Jesus Christ the Lord and himself the servant of others for Jesus' sake. Okay? He had, Paul, still, no power to impose upon them arbitrary things or articles of faith which he had not received from Christ. So, when Paul teaches this, what does that do to all the different councils that we were reading of? You remember last time I was telling you about the uh, explanation that Martin Luther gave us of these different councils. That's one part. And of course, what we read in the book, the history of the Inquisition, about all the early councils, starting with the council in 325 at Nicaea, 381 in Constantinople, then the next one I forgot, and then you have uh, the Council of Chalcedon. These four, and they call it themselves ecumenical councils. Sorry, I had to <laughs> scratch my ear here for a second. Uh, uh, all these ecumenical councils. These councils who assume of themselves the power to impose upon the laity and the clergy articles of faith which they, in the councils, have not received from Christ. Yeah? And that accordingly he determined to know nothing but Christ and Christ crucified, meaning to preach nothing but the pure and uncorrupted doctrines of his gospel. And that this was the, his great comfort, and that he had not shunned to declare the counsel of God. If then, he ins uh, if then the inspired apostles were to confine themselves to what they received from God, and had no power to make articles of faith and fix terms of communion and salvation, other than what they were immediately ordered to do by Christ himself, it is absolutely impossible that the clergy can have that power now, who have, as I apprehend, no immediate commission from Christ, nor any direct inspiration from his Holy Spirit. A very important point the author makes here in this book. Yeah? 
If then the inspired apostles were to confine themselves to what they received from God and had absolutely no power to make articles and faiths and fixed terms of communion and salvation other than that they were immediately ordered to do by Jesus Christ himself, if they didn't have that power, it is absolutely impossible that the clergy of later times can have that power now who have no immediate commission from Christ, nor any direct inspiration from his Holy Spirit. No, because in that Orthodox Church, in that Roman Catholic Church, it is another spirit that rules. It is not the spirit of Christ. It is the spirit of Antichrist. Nor is there anything in the circumstances of the world to render such a power desirable, because the Apostles have shown us all things that we need believe or practice as Christians, and commanded the preachers of the gospel to teach no other doctrines but what they received from them. Hence, St. Peter's advice to the elders that they should seek the flock of God, not as lording it over the heritage. And St. Paul, in his epistles to Timothy, instructing him in the nature of the gospel doctrines and duties, tells him that by putting the brethren in remembrance of these things, he would approve himself a good minister of Jesus Christ, and commands Timothy to take heed, of him, uh, heed to himself and to the doctrines he had taught him, and to continue in them, charging him in the sight of God and before Christ Jesus to keep the commandments given him, that which was committed to this truth without spot, unbreakable, till the appearance of Jesus Christ. These were the things to which Timothy was con to confine himself and to commit to others, that they might be continually preached in the Christian church and of consequence this the same apostolic doctrine that the bishops or elders or ministers of the church are to instruct their hearers in now as far as they understand it without mixing anything of their own with it or of any other persons whatsoever. You see that? Without mixing anything of their own with it. Mixing it with traditions, the traditions of men, the Roman Catholic Church, teaches that the tradition of her, the church, stands even above the word of God. The tradition of the Roman Catholic Church stands above the word, stands above the Bible. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church says it's not sola scriptura, it's not the Bible and the Bible alone, it is the Bible and traditions. And then adds that these traditions even stand above the Bible. So where does that come from? We see this already here in the part that I was just reading, without mixing anything of their own with it, or of any other persons whatsoever. Any other persons, like the Pope, but uh, mixing anything of their own with it, their own traditions. The Word of God is not to be mixed with anything else. The Word of God does not even make any compromises. But when you compromise the Word of God and teach that to others, then you are teaching not the Word of God, but you are teaching your own thing. You mix your own traditions with the Word of God. <coughs> the great end and design of the ministerial office is for the perfecting of the saints and the edifying of the body of Christ. Hence, the elders are commanded to take heed to, them th to themselves and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made them bishops, overseers, eh? to feed the church of God. They were likewise exhorted to hold fast the faithful word as they had been taught, that by sound doctrine they may be able to exhort and convince others. A very important point. I'm going to highlight this and I'm going to read it again and you will understand in a second why. They are likewise exhorted to hold fast the faithful word as they had been taught, that by sound doctrine they may be able to exhort and convince others. The Roman Catholic Church says, convert or die. 
the Bible says, and the teaching here says, by sound doctrine they may be able to exhort and convince others. So I am to convince others not because of pressure, not because of persecution, but only because of sound doctrine. And I don't want to take that away from the book, because the book on the next page goes on to that, because I read about it. Otherwise I would have said, what do you think is the weapon that we as Bible-believing Christians are holding in our hands? But the author goes into that himself, so I don't uh, make a comment here now. But it should be clear to us now that when we read the sentence, they are likewise exhorted to hold fast the faithful word, as they had been taught, nothing to add, nothing to take away, that by sound doctrine alone they may be able to exhort and convince others. I can only convince with the word. They are to give attendance to reading. They are to give attendance to exhortation and doctrine and to put others in remembrance of the great truth of the gospel, charging them before the Lord not to strive about unprofitable words, but to be gentle to all men, and in meekness to instruct even those who oppose. So that means when you come to someone and you teach him someone and he opposes you, what are you going to do? Are you going to get mad and ranting and shouting and be violent? No, you have to turn to meekness to instruct even those who oppose you. They are to contend earnestly to the faith, as well as other Christians. But then, it is for that faith which was once delivered to the saints. And even for this, the servant of the Lord is not to fight. He is not to use carnal, but spiritual weapons, nor to put on any armor but that of righteousness on the right hand and on the the left. Yeah? We can read that in uh, 2 Timothy. I can't see the verse from here, but in 2 Timothy we can read that. He is not to use carnal, but spiritual weapons, nor to put on any armor, but that of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left. Put on the whole armor of God. What is that? Righteousness. How can you put on righteousness? Get saved by Jesus Christ and he imputes righteousness on you because there is not one righteous, no, not one. But when you are saved, you are imputed righteousness by Jesus Christ and that's your armor. They are to speak the truth, but it must be in love. The truth must be spoken in love. The truth must not be spoken in hatred. They should be zealously affected, but it should be always in a good thing. They must stop the mouth of unruly. They must stop the mouth of unruly and vain talkers. Huh? Stop the mouth of unruly and vain talkers, but it must be by uncorruptness of doctrine. It must be by gravity, by sincerity and by sound speech that cannot be condemned. Well, the only sound speech that cannot be condemned that I know of is the Word of God, is the Bible. Upon these and the like accounts, they are said to be over us in the Lord, to rule us and to be our guides. Words that do not imply any dominion, um, that they have over the consciences of others or any right in them to prescribe articles of faith and terms of communion for others. You got it? Words that do not imply any dominion that they have over the consciences of others, yeah? having dominion over the consciences of others, nor any right in them to prescribe articles of faith and terms of communion for others. This they are expressly forbidden and commanded to preach the word of God only, sola scriptura, and pronounced a 
cursed if they teach any other gospel than that which they have received from the apostles. And of consequence, when we are, to, uh, when we are bid to obey and submit ourselves to them, it is meant then and then only when they rule us in the Lord. Not for their own sakes, but when they rule us in the Lord, when they speak to us the word of God, the Bible and the Bible alone, and labor in the word and doctrine. In all other cases, listen closely, in all other cases they have no power, nor is there any obedience due to them. Now, this is a very important sentence, because you can... You, uh, a lot of people interpret Romans 13 still wrong today because they say all power is given by God and the, the powers that be are ordained by God, as Paul said in Romans 13. But there never was a righteous government in this world that was ordained by God because all governments just work for themselves. They make themselves God. And this actually can be linked to Romans 13 and that kind of understanding. You have to do a little bit study on your own. I can't tell you everything here. But in all other cases means that uh, it says here, speak to us the word of God. If they don't speak to us in the word of God, when they labor the word not in the doctrine of the, of the Bible, then that's another case. And in all other cases, they have no power nor is there any obedience due to them. Do you know why so many people in this world have power? Only because we grant it to them. Only because when they say something, we obey. I mean, think about it. Whether you're in the United States, or in the UK, or in Belgium, or in Germany, or whatever, what, what do you think if all the people got together for one day and said, no, we're not going to pay our taxes anymore? and the people would just not pay their taxes and all that stuff, what do you think happened? The people who so-called rule the other people will see where the real power is. If nobody would obey the authorities anymore, yeah, of course, then we would have, quote-unquote, anarchy. Anarchy is the absence of authority, is the absence of power from above. It is not lawlessness. When we all adhere to the laws given by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by our Maker, we wouldn't need all the other laws and we wouldn't need any authority, quote-unquote authority, any government whatsoever. We would have him and his laws. But that goes too far. And anyway, this sentence in all other cases, so when it is not... Uh, a sent here of consequence uh, when we are to bid to obey and submit ourselves to them, the apostles, it is meant then and then only when they rule us in the Lord. Yeah? So when we are ruled in the Lord, then we are to obey. In all other cases, who does not rule us in the Lord, now think about your government, does it rule you in the Lord, according to the Bible, they have no power, but the power that we give to them. Nor is there any obedience due to them. <laughs> what did the Pope say when he came to the United States of America? Um, this is, oh, come on here, yeah, this one. What did the Pope say when he came to the United States of America and he came into uh, into the Senate? <laughs> Look at this picture that is taken exactly from there. The Pope enters the United States of America Congress in 2015. It was, yeah. All hail Caesar. Who said all hail Caesar? Pope Pius IX, Pino, Pio Nono, in his Discorsi on page 253 said, quote, The Caesar who now addresses you and to whom alone are obedience and fidelity due. Unquote. Now what does the author says here? 
when you are ruled in the Lord, then you are to listen and to obey. In all other cases, they have no power, nor is there any obedience due to them. Ha! Huh. Obedience due? What does the Pope say? I am Caesar and address you, and to me alone is obedience and fidelity due. Does he do that on the basis of what is written in the Word, what is written in the Bible? No. So when he does not do that in that regard, do we have to listen? No, we don't. We don't have to listen to this Pope, we don't have to listen to any Pope that came before, and we don't have to listen to any Pope that comes, comes afterwards. Because he does not speak with godly authority. He does not speak with the authority of the word, of the Bible, the word of God. He speaks of his own authority. And that means that he actually doesn't have any. They are to be respected and to be had in, held, uh, and to be had in double honor for their work's sake, i.e., when they preach not themselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and when their faith and conversation is such as to become worthy our imitation. Listen, but if they teach otherwise, if they teach otherwise, like him, for example, and consent not to the work of our Lord Jesus, if they doubt about words whereof come envy, whereof come strife and railing, supposing that gain is godliness, from such we are commanded to withdraw ourselves. So what does that do to what Pope Francis says here? If you do not speak according to the word of God, according to the teachings of Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no obedience and fidelity due to you, Mr. Pope, Mr. Antichrist. You, who is the vicar of Satan on earth. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such we are commanded to withdraw ourselves. Yeah. The episcopal character, however otherwise greatly venerable, then forfeits the reverence due to it and becomes contemptible. So that there are no powers or privileges annexed to the episcopal or ministerial character in the sacred writings that are in the least favorable to the cause of persecution, or that countenance so vile and detestable a practice. As to the affair of excommunication by which the clergy have, uh, by which the, clergy have set uh, the world so often in a flame, there is nothing in the sacred records that confines the right of exercising it to them, nor any command ever to exercise it but towards notorious and scandalous offenders. The incestuous Corinthian was delivered over to Satan by the church in full assembly, on which account his punishment for censure is said to be by many. And though St. Paul bids Titus to reject an heretic, and also bids the Corinthians to put away that wicked person from amongst them, which had brought such scandal upon the church, and the Thessalonians to withdraw themselves from every brother that should walk disorderly. So that as the clergy have no right from the New Testament to determine in controversies of faith, nor to create any new species of heresy, so neither have they any exclusive right to cut off any persons from the body of the church, much less to cut them off from it for their submitting to the creeds and canons, and of the consequence of no power to not submitting to their creeds and canons, and of consequence no power to mark them out by this act to the civil magistrate as objects 
of his indignation and vengeance. I have been the longer on this head, that I might fully vindicate the Christian revelation from every suspicion of being favourable to persecution. Notwithstanding some late insinuations of this kind that have been thrown against it by the processed adversaries, let but the expressions of scripture be interpreted with the same candour as any other, writing are, uh, any other writings are, and there will not be found a single sentence to countenance this doctrine and practice. And therefore, though men of corrupt minds or weak judgments have, for the sake of worldly advantages, worldly advantages, or through strong prejudices, entered into the measures of persecution under pretense of vindication the Christian religion, yet, as they have no support, no support at all, and foundation in the gospel of Christ. The gospel ought not to be reproached for this, or any other faults of those who profess to believe it. Let persecution be represented as a most detestable and impious practice, and let persecutors over every denomination and degree bear all the reproaches they deserve and be esteemed as they ought to be the disturbers, the plagues and curses of mankind and the church of God. But let not the religion of Jesus Christ suffer for their crimes, nor share any part of that, of that scandal, which is due only to those who have dishonored their character and profession, and abused the most beneficent and, and any uh, and kind institution that ever appeared in the world. It is in order to expose this shameful practice and render it the abhorrence of all mankind that I have drawn up the foregoing sheets, and I presume that no one who hath not put off humanity itself can read them without becoming sentiments of indignation. The true use to be made of that history is not to think dishonorably of Christ and his religion, not to contemn and despise his faithful ministers, who, by preaching the practice by reason and argument, endeavor to propagate knowledge, piety, righteousness, charity, and all the virtues of private and social life. The blessing of the Almighty God be with them. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ succeed and prosper them. I say, therefore, the use of the foregoing history <clears throat> is to teach men to adhere close to the doctrines and words of Christ and his apostles, to argue for the doctrines of the gospel with meekness and charity, to introduce no new terms of salvation and Christian communion not to trouble the Christian Church with metaphysical subtleties and abstruse questions that minister to quarrelling and strife, not to pronounce censures, judgments and anathemas upon such as may differ from us in speculative truth, and to exclude, uh, not to exclude men from the rights of civil society, nor lay them under the negative or positive discouragements of conscience sake, or for their different usages and rights in the externals of Christian worship, but to remove those which are already laid, and which are as much a scandal to the authors and continuers of them, as they are a burden to those who labor under them. These were the sole views that count, not any design to reflect on the clergy in general, whose office and character I greatly reverence, and who, by acting according to the original design of their institution, would prove the most useful set of men in every nation and kingdom, and thereby secure to themselves all, all the esteem that could reasonably desire in the present world, and, what is infinitely more valuable, the approbation of, the, of their great Lord and Master in another. The end. Means we have come to the end 
of part one of this book. And so you see, here is where part two starts that we will read next time. Just going to make this a little smaller that we can see all the pages. And we're going to read this next time where we go into volume two. Uh, after the dedication, which takes a few pages, so that's going to be at least one reading. And this is from Philip A. Limborch. As you can see, this is from the author himself. So this introduction that we just read, all the introduction, all the first volume, in, uh, actually, the complete first volume was added by the translator, Samuel Chandler, who translated this book and published that in 1731. The book originally was written in 1692 by Philip A. Limborch, as you can see here on this page. And then we're going to continue uh, in what is called the preface to the reader, where the author Philip from Limborch speaks to ourselves. And this starts actually the second um, uh, the second volume of the book, History of the Inquisition. And then we, of course, go into the real persecution that took place. And we will also go into that, what I uh, very first uh, learned, the very first time before I even got that book, uh, that was cited from Henry Gretton Gillis in his book Romanism and the Reformation, what Tom read on the 13th part of Romanism and the Reformation. You can find that on my channel and watch it for yourself. Now he speaks of Limborch and he speaks of a person who came out of the Inquisition. And the testimony that that person gave was so overwhelming to me that I at that time decided to read the book History of the Inquisition. And we have just finished Volume 1 and we are going to start a Volume 2. Even though I received Volume 2 as a physical book, I will keep reading in the PDF on the computer, not only because it is more easy for me to make the video like this, but also because that book that was sent to me is a fraud. And uh, the printing even on the PDF here on the screen is sometimes even better to read than the printing that from that book that I received. So, today on the 20th of April, that was the finish finishing of uh, Volume 1 of History of the Inquisition by Philip from Limborch. And until next time, do your own study, get a copy of the book, read for yourself, read along with me, read this book, read other books. Have a look at my channels, Juggler66, uh, War on Disinformation, the other channel. Have a look on other YouTube channels and check out Tom Fress on Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio at this moment reading the Foundations Under Attack from Michael de Semlian. And go to my main channel and check out the earlier book reading of me, of Michael de Semlian's earlier book, All Roads Lead to Rome. Until next time, Juggler66 from Hour of the Truth signing off says, God bless you and bye bye.